the master, the bowing of me and you, but not to each other as if we're gods or something, are uh, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, translated by James Houghton Woods. This is the meaning. The constraint with respect to one's own subliminal impressions extends by analogy to those of others also in the words, precisely as in other cases also. With this in view, he introduces as an aid to faith the dialogue between Jaiksavya and Avakya, who had passed through the experience by saying, On this point, the tale is handed down. Now, what good is experience for society if we can't pass on our science or experience or history or whatnot? Um, A great creative period is a great mundane cycle. The words who had assumed a coarse body, the perfection of a created body is described. Spotless is brilliant, that from which the stains of Rajas and Tamas have been removed. Mastery over the primary cause means power. By having this power, and by creating movements in the primary cause, he gives to anyone that kind of perfection of body or of organs, which he wishes to confer upon him, and further having created his own bodies and organs by thousands of roves through air and sky and earth at will. Bliss. Santosa is the dwelling of desire and the external aspect of undisturbed calm belonging to the sattva of the thinking substance, 19, as a result of constraint upon a presented idea there arises intuitive knowledge of the mind stuff of another. As a result of constraint upon a presented idea in consequence of the direct perception of the presented idea there arises the intuitive knowledge of the mind stuff of another 19 upon a presented idea is knowledge of the mind stuff of another as a result of the direct perception of the presented idea that is of mind stuff in general of another ilm al yakin is the uh, transferred claim to knowledge, the conviction based on it's been claimed. Now, faith after belief comes, well, there's some reason behind that. It's, uh, well, it was said, I better believe it. Um, it's, well, who, who said it? Why? Um, what other, you know, what truths do we know about that would lead us to believe the rest of what they're saying, you know? Various things. 20. But the intuitive knowledge of the presented idea of another does not have that idea together with that upon which it depends as its object, since that upon which it depends is not in the field of consciousness. The yogin knows that the presented idea is affected, but he does not know that it is affected in dependence upon this or that object. When the presented idea of another person is in dependence upon something, this object does not become something upon which the mind stuff of the yogin depends, but it is the other's presented idea only upon which the yogin's mind stuff comes to depend. Just as the direct perception of the subliminal impressions implies the direct perception of previous births and of adjuncts to these, so the direct perception of another's mind stuff might imply the direct perception of that upon which the mind stuff depends. To this conclusion, Prapta, he says 20, but the intuitive knowledge of the presented idea of another does not have that idea together with that upon which it depends as its object, since that upon which it depends is not in the field of consciousness. Oh, a better 
well, I'll, I'll read this last bit, and then I'll read that without the translation. That constraint, book 2, 19, as you know, I've already passed that, um, has for its object the subliminal impressions with their adjuncts, but this has its object, the other's mind stuff, and nothing more. This is what he needs to say, 20, but it does not have that together with that upon which it depends, since that upon which it depends is not in the field. 21. As a result of the constraint upon the outer form of the body, when its power to be known is stopped, then as a consequence of the disjunction of the light out of the eye, there follows indiscernibility of the yogin's body. As a result of the constraint upon the form of the body, the yogin inhibits that imperceptible power by which the coarse and external is known. When its power is to be known, is stopped. When its power to be known is stopped, as a consequence of the disjunction of the light, that is, of the other person, the observer, and of the eye, that is, the organ, indiscernibility of the yogin is produced. In this way, it must be understood that the indiscernibility to sound and other objects of sense has also been described. Body, indiscernibility. Well, I guess I'll say it without the thing, because I'm not seeing... It repeated, um, as a result of constraint upon the form of the body when its power to be known is stopped, then as a consequence of the disjunction of the light and of the eye, there follows indiscernibility. A body has its essence in the five coarse elements, and as having form, it comes under the eye, for as far, uh, for as having form, the body and the color of the body pass through the experience of being the object of the action, of the process of knowing by the eye. Thus, when the yogin performs a special kind of constraint upon the external form, then the power of being known which belongs to the color and which is the source of the direct perception of a body having form is stopped. Therefore, when the power to be known is stopped, the yogin becomes indiscernible. In other words, the body of the yogin does not become the object of the thinking coming from the eye. The meaning is that when this is done, indiscernibility is the cause. In this way, when as a result of constraint upon sound or touch or taste or smell with reference to the body, the power of these four objects of sense to be known is stopped. And when there is no connection between light, that is, of the other person, the observer and the other's organ of hearing and of touch, or of taste, or of smell, then the yogin becomes indiscernible to these organs. Such lutatis utandis is the meaning of the sutra. So, in addition to awareness, the non-awareness... But the non-awareness that is also an awareness, right? The greater awareness. 22. Advancing and not advancing is karma. You know, cause, effect, action. As a result of constraint upon this twofold karma or from the signs of death, there arises an intuitive knowledge of the latter end. Karma, having its fruition and length of life, is of two kinds, and the not advancing of the two, just as a wet cloth spread out dries in a shorter time, so is advancing karma, and just as the same cloth rolled into a ball becomes dry a long time after, so it is not advancing karma. 
Advancing karma is also like fire set in dry grass, which spreads on all sides with the breeze and burns in the briefest time. And just as the same fire, being bit by bit into a pile of grass, burns a long time after it is not so advancing karma, this is the karma of having its limit in a single existence and causing the length of life of two kinds, the advancing and the, non, and the not advancing. As a result of constraint upon this, there is intuitive knowledge of the latter end of the decease or from the signs of death. There arises an intuitive knowledge of the latter end. A sign of death is of three kinds, that pertaining to the self, and that pertaining to the other creatures, and that pertaining to the divine beings. And by divine, I, I presume they mean angels, not really divine beings. Of these three, a sign of death pertaining to oneself would occur. One with stopped ears does not hear the sound of the vital spirits with one, one's own body or when one with closed eyes does not see the inner light. Likewise, a sign pertaining to other creatures would occur when one sees the men of Yama, or when one sees unexpectedly the fathers, the departed. Similarly, a sign pertaining to the light beings would occur when one sees heaven or the siddhas unexpectedly, or when everything is reversed. By this sign also he perceives that the latter end is near at hand. 32. Advancing and not advancing is karma. As a result of constraint upon this, or from the signs of death, is knowledge of the latter end. And karma having its fruition and length of life is of two kinds. The advancing and the not advancing. Now the karma which has its limit in a single existence and which is the source of birth and of length of life and of a kind of enjoyment has a fruition in length of life. And this is ready to afford the kind of enjoyment without delay of even a very short time. It is afforded much of the kind of enjoyment, and only a little of its fruit remains. Its functional activity continues only because it is impossible for it to have its fruition suddenly in one body. Therefore, it delays. This is advancing karma. The advance is the functional activity. The karma is connected with this functional activity. The same karma when it affords little fruit, requires time for this, and when engaged in affording fruit, its functional activities is intermittent and slow and is not advancing. The same is made clear in two similes, with the words of these, one just as, on the same point, for greater clearness, he gives another simile in the words, two, are just as fire. The final end is the great mundane dissolution. As compared with this, death is the latter end. As a result of constraint upon the right living and wrong living in that karma, there follows intuitive knowledge of the latter end. And as a result of this, the yogin, knowing his own karma, which it is advancing and having created many bodies for himself, experiences suddenly the fruit of karma and dies when he wills. Incidentally, the author says, or the intuitive knowledge of the latter end is the result of the signs of death. Signs of death, aresta, are things which terrify, such as the enemy, aref. The indications of death are three kinds, or when everything is reversed, that is, even when there is no jugglery, villages, and cities, he deems to be heaven, and the word of only human beings to be a world of divine beings. Well, if there's a divine being, uh, certainly the Nexians would overlap, right? 23. 
as a result of constraint upon friendliness and other sentiments, there arises powers of friendliness. Friendliness and compassion and joy are the three sentiments. As to these three, by feeling friendliness for living beings who are in happiness, he discovers the power of friendliness. By feeling compassion for those in pain, he discovers the power of compassion. By feeling joy for those who are disposed to merit, he discovers the power of joy. As a result of the sentiments, there arises the constraint which is concentration, and from it there arises powers of unfailing energy. Indifference, however, for these disposed to evil is not one of these practiced sentiments, and therefore there is no concentration upon it. For this reason, since it is impossible to perform constraint upon it, there is no power resulting from indifference. 23. Upon friendliness and other powers. By constraint, upon friendliness and other sentiments, he gains powers of friendliness and other powers. Of these three, as a result of the sentiment of friendliness, there arises in him that kind of power by which he makes everyone happy. As a result of this, he is kindly to all. Similarly, through the power of resulting from compassion, he delivers living beings from pain and from the causes of pain. Likewise, through the power of joy, he imparts the detached attitude to everybody. He states what will be of assistance and what will be said, namely that sentiments cause concentration. And he says, as a result of the sentiments, there arises the constraint, which is concentration. Although constraint is the three fixed attention and contemplation and concentration and not concentration alone. And since constraint follows as an effect after concentration, and since concentration is the dominant of the three, concentration is figuratively used for constraint. Some manuscripts read, the sentiments are concentration. In this case, we must suppose that the sentiments and concentration as being parts of the whole, which is constraint, serve as causes of the constraint. Energy is exertion. By its means, a man who has the powers of friendliness, etc., towards a person in happiness and becomes unfailing in his exertion when things are to be done for others. Indifference is the detached attitude. In this case, there is no sentiment, nor is there anything that might arise out of it, and in the case of those who are in happiness. And in buddhi yoga, you got to maintain, you got to continue, got to keep doing, and that's where, you know, oh, I did something once. Well, maybe you did something that wasn't even friendliness, but if you cultivate friendliness and maintain the friendliness, it comes out of something different, right? 24. As a result of constraint upon powers, there arise powers like those of an elephant. See, th that's the reason why there's all these so-called God forms, is this is something we're supposed to see in the natural world and we're supposed to bring out for ourselves. As a result of constraint upon the power of an elephant, one has the power of an elephant as a result of concentration upon the power of Ba in Ateya, the Garuda bird. One has the power of Ba in Ateya. As a result of constraint upon the power of the wind, one has the power of the wind, and so forth in the same way. 24. Upon powers, powers like those of an elephant, he gains the power of that upon which is constraint. 25. As a result of casting the light of a sense activity, there arises the intuitive knowledge of the subtle and the concealed and the obscured. And the yogin, by casting the light of that sense activity of the central organ, which is called luminous, Book 1, 36. Upon an object, whether subtle or concealed or obscured, 
has access to that object, 25. As a result of casting the light of a sense activity, knowledge of the subtle and the concealed and the obscure, you know, if we break things down, your techniques, light is the sun. Relaxation would be the moon. Right? Um, casting his mind with constraint upon a subtle or concealed or obscure intended object. He has access to that intended object. 26. As a result of constraint upon the sun, there arises the intuitive knowledge of the cosmic spaces. Bhuvana. Om Bhubav Subaha. Okay. Uh, how's that chant go? Om Bhubha. Om Bhubha. Um. So, yes, you know. Anyway. The enumeration of these cosmic spaces. There are seven words among them. Starting... Starting from the Avicii Nadir and extending upwards to the summit of Meru is the Earth world, Bu Loka. Beginning from the summit of Meru and going as far as the pole star, Druva, the world of intermediate space, diversified by planets and asterisms and stars. Beyond that is the fivefold heaven world, Svarloka. The world of Mahendra, the third world. The Mahar world of Krajapate, the fourth world. The threefold world of Brahma, that is the jhana world, and the tapas world, and the satya world. Remember, Buddhism and kind of connects to Jainism, in a way. Um, the world of Brahma, in its three stages, Below it, the world of Prajapate, the great world. And below it, Mahindra's world. These five are called heaven, Svar. In the sky of intermediate space are the stars on earth, the creatures. And thus saith the summary stanza, raising in a series above Aditya, there are six regions, Bhume of the great hall, Maha Naraka, Supported respectively by solid matter, by water, by fire, by wind, by air, and by darkness, namely the Mahakala, the Ambarisa, the Rauravā, the Mahārauravā, the Kala Sutra, and the Anthatanisra wherein living creatures, having been allotted a long and grievous length of life, feeling the misery incurred as a result of their own karma, are born. Next, the seven lower worlds, Patala, with the names Mahatala, Rasatala, Atala, Sutala, Vitala, Tala, Tala, and Patala. And as the eighth, this earth, with its seven lands, Dvipa, and in the midst of it, the golden king of mountains, Sumeru, its peaks are the four sides made of gems of silver, of lapis lazuli, of crystal, and of gold. 
So there's... The, uh, the, the point is the afterlife is different depending on how we've left, lived this life. Um, so, Bu and Tarek Shah. Then you have Svar. This is divided. You've got the Brahma divided into Satya, Tapas, and Jhana. And the other uh, four, Marhar, Prajapatya, and Mahadendra. Oh, wait, that, that, okay. That doesn't even need a footnote other than to diagram it. Um, by reason of the reflection of the brilliant color of the lapis lazuli, the southern quarter of the sky is the deep blue of the petal of the blue lotus. The eastern is white, the western is translucent, the northern is like the golden amaranth, and on its southern slope is the rose apple tree, from which this land is called the land of the rose apple. As the sun moves forward day and night, as it were fast bound to him revolve about Sumeru, north of this, Sumeru, Sumeru are three mountains, blue and white, peaked 2,000 yogjanas in extent. Between these three zones, Barsa, 9,000 yogjanas each, called Ramannaka, Heranmeya, and the northern Kurus. On the south, the mountains of Nesadda, of the gold horn and of the snow crags, 2,000 yojanas in extant. Between these three zones of 9,000 yojanas each, called Dahari Varsha, Kim Purusa, Bahrata, on the east of Sumeru, the countries of Badrachva. Bounded by the Mayavat Mountains on the west, the countries of Ketumala, bounded by the Gondamadana Mountains. Is that Afghanistan? Gondar would be Afghanistan. Um, in the middle of the zone of nine, Ilavr Duh. The same, the land of the rose apple, a hundred thousand yojanas in extant stretches in each direction from Samaro for half this distance. Now the land of the rose apple, a hundred thousand yojanas in extant, is a, encompassed by a girdle shaped of sea salt, the double thereof. And then there are the lands of Chaka, Kucha, Krauncha, Kalmala, Magadda, and Puskara, each double the preceding, fringed with marvelous hills, and the seven seas, flat like a pile of mustard seeds, with their waters of sugarcane juice, of spirits, of butter, of curd, of cream, of milk, and of Triacle. These lands encompassed by the seven seas and girdle shaped and encircled by the Loka Loka mountains are estimated at five hundred millions of Yojanas in extant. This whole well founded configuration stretches out at the bendmost part of the world egg, and the egg is a minute fragment of the primary cause, like a firefly in the sky. Here in the lower world, in the sea, in these mountains, groups of entities have their abode. Asuras, Gandharvas, Kinaras, 
Kinaros. Okay. Kim Peru Sauce. Yak Sauce. Rak Sa Sauce. Butas. Pretas. Pichachas. Apas Maracas. Apsar as s Brahma Rak Sasas Kus Mandas Vinna Yakas and all the lands of materi uh, meritorious entities and human beings have their abode. Sumer Sumerum is the pleasure ground of the thirty three entities. You can think of them as different names of God, or you can just think of natural 33 good things. I think that's what they're referring to, is the 33 good things, which later got told. Uh, the Agnes Vatas, the Yamyas, the Tusitas, the Aparin Irmita, Vacha Vartims, and the Pare Nirmitta Vacha Vartans. All these fill their desires and are endowed with atomization and the other powers. They live for a mundane period. They are goodly to behold and they light in love. Their bodies are not caused by parents. Their retinue is made of incomparable and not prudish absarasas. In the great world of Prajapate, there is a five-fold group of entities, the Kumudas, the Prabhus, the Pratardanas, the Anjana Vas, and the Prachita Vas. These have the mastery over the great elements. Their food is contemplation. Their lives are for a thousand mundane periods. In the first of the worlds of Brahma, in the Janna world, there is a fourfold group of entities, the Brahma Purohitas, the Brahma Kayikas, the Brahma Malakayikas, and the Amaras. These have the mastery over the elements and the organs. In the second of the worlds of Brahma, in the tapas world, there is a threefold group of entities called the Apasvaras, 